Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, the Museum of Digital Things, Diverse Strategies for Managing uh, Digital Experience. So in this session, we'd like to explore with you some of the contemporary challenges in managing the digital footprint of our museums at scale. Uh, first of all, I'd, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce the, uh, the panel. Oh, okay, sorry, Can, is that better? Okay, so first of all, I'd like to, uh, to, to introduce the, uh, the panel. Uh, I'm Brian Dawson, uh, Chief Digital Officer with, the, with the Ingenium. Uh, turn, it, turn it up. What's that? We'd have to go to project. Okay, uh, okay, let's give this a try. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm Brian Dawson, uh, Chief uh, Digital Officer with Ingenium, Canada's Museums of, uh, of Science and Innovation. I'm uh, Jordan Randall, the Director of uh, IT and Digital Technologies with Science World in Vancouver. Jane Alexander, um, Chief Information Officer at Cleveland Museum of Art. Corey Timpson, Vice President of Exhibitions, Research and Design at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Uh, so for our session today, we've actually organized a session uh, to, to explore three main themes, uh, systems, people, and uh, sustainability. I'm, I'm driving it. Oh, oh, you're oh, you're driving it. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, thanks. Um, so and so, we're gonna we're gonna explore each of these themes okay. using some examples from projects from each of our institutions, just to illustrate some of the contemporary challenges that we're all facing, and to point in some directions in terms of some of the possible solutions. Uh, it's important for us to be saving time, um, kind of at the uh, at the back end of the the session, for an open discussion with all of you around these themes. Uh, we only have an hour um, for, this, uh, for this session overall, so we're going to dive uh, right into things right now. Uh, to get us started, we're going to briefly introduce the projects. Um, there's a great mix of projects from different kinds of institutions that bring a broad range of perspectives. And so, onward to the projects. Um, so the case study that I'm going to sort of be talking about is the uh, new Artlands exhibition, which is part of the Artlands gallery suite of activities. And really, I, well, this is a great case study because we really had to think about how are we going to do this so that it is truly sustainable, scalable, and able to add interactives for its lifetime. Um, and as one of the things that also that we involved with the people is not only in planning the interactives and actually asking our colleagues to come and assess how it looked and inviting people in the community and people in the museum that had nothing to do with Art Lens Gallery. We also um, have used our staff that every uh, tech actually has to rotate into that space during the day at some time during the week. There is always a tech in the space. So we've really gone sort of from the server room to outward experiences to actually we're a part of the board, you know, boardroom meetings um, every um, quarter quarterly um, through evolution and need IT has become an increasingly integrated and combi um, combined into the museum experience from digital signage to digital interactives technology is everywhere our goal is to be closely aligned with our exhibit counterparts within the institution to enable them uh, and work collaboratively every step of the way traditionally our museum was mostly standalone analog exhibits uh, galleries were operated by staff um, who took weeks to learn the ins and outs of the space and everything was a manual process. Uh, bespoke or off-the-shelf exhibits were created without standardization or adherence to guidance and the exhibition department was working in a silo. So we're going to be exploring um, what we did to kind of correct this um, and uh, bring it into the digital age. Um, so next project. Um, so at the um at Ingenium, we just uh, rebuilt um, our National Museum of Science and Technology essentially from scratch. Uh, it's been closed for three years, so it's a total rebuild of the, of, the, um, of the facility. And that gave us a chance to do a total rethink in terms of how we, um, how we were going to grapple with some of the challenges that we were facing in terms of kind of managing that, that, um, that, uh, the, uh, the, the role of digital on the museum floor. And we also knew that uh, the digital would be playing an increasing role in this uh, in this reboot as well. Now, one thing, uh, next slide, is this project was done under very very uh, tight uh, time constraints and, and and significant budget constraints as well. So there was a lot of uh, a lot of um, sort of ingenuity and creativity along the way in, in that uh, in that process. 
So uh, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights has been open for three years now. And uh, I throw up this slide because this is our largest gallery. It's our largest gallery in terms of content, but also in terms of experience design and uh, different interactions. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I want um, everyone to, whenever I'm speaking, sort of keep that, that previous gallery slide in mind because uh, the pre, yeah, that one. Um, <laughs> Um, so when I think of our subject matter, it's intangible and it's contemporary. So human rights is a concept and it's uh, not a very uh, newly coined concept. Our exhibitions and programs are transmedia. It's not about the artifact, it's about the story. The story is expressed through artifacts, through digital, uh, through mixed media installations where everything works together in concert. And in terms of our co collections, our collections are born digital. We don't collect 3D artifacts, we collect stories, uh, oral histories. Um, so this leads to metadata standardization. And when I'm interviewed and asked, um, you know, what's the craziest, best technology in the museum, um, you know, people are always expecting to hear, oh, holograms or something, but really it's a content management system um, that is also our collections management, management system. So um, as we go through systems, people, and sustainability, I'm going to be speaking about the content management system, uh, but to the end goal of how this affects the, what we do uh, for the visitor experience. Um, so we're on the system slide? Okay, great. Um, challenges around system, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, systems are the backbone of our institutions. They're what guide and govern us. They're a tool to use and a process to follow. Some of our institutions are far along in developing modern, robust systems, while others are still working on creating ones that work for themselves. What change has occurred to have, our, um, have or revision, re envision our systems and processes? So um, I've shown this slide before, and we constantly are always updating it. But um, from the very beginning, uh, when we decided we were going to do these interactive activities, we did look at our back-end systems. And we have 36 uh, database systems that run everything from all our different collections base, including our digital asset management system, our collection catalog system, our library systems, to our business process systems, which are all in green and light green um, for our ticketing, our tessitura, our donors, our members, and purple, all our internal um, uh, HR systems and intranets, and then outward facing, well, actually, outward facing would be intranet. Yellow is all our sort of outward um, facing activities. All these need to be pulling information from each other. And so from a, like four years ago, it was like we need we're about building APIs for all of it to to speak to each other. So with this new project that we just finished, um, that just opened this past summer, the new Artlands Gallery and the Artlands Exhibition, we went through using yet another um, interactive design firm to help us explore and create new activities. And the biggest, the most strain was how it connects to our back end. And we found every time we worked with a new client, they had to really understand and learn our whole new back end system. So we are right now, we were going to do some other outward um, existing projects, but I stopped the team and said, we right now are working on this back end so that um, we can co um, develop a new API um, for all to, for our custom built um, catalog and con collection system. And um, that there was a single source for all our artwork. So no matter what we do, the standards are in place so that any interactive developer can come in and help us think and create really cool things and we put the energy in the right place. So um, by December this will all be complete. We're really excited and um, we will see as I've stated up there um, these are the improvements we will have right away and this way depending on what type of technology a firm is using or how they're thinking we can deploy them and they don't have to learn our completely integrated back-end system that would drive anyone crazy. Um, and this is sort of the chart of what that will be looking like. All right, thanks. Um, so uh, we've taken a bit more of a pragmatic and practical approach to how we um, support our exhibit counterparts um, with digital interactives. Uh, we start off using, um, for example, Windows imaging tools and, and other standardized IT processes. Um, such as Microsoft Deployment Toolbox. Um, we use uh, multi-purpose exhibit PCs 
um, such as Intel Nux, uh, where we can rapidly provision um, equipment for the digital interactive and adapt it on the fly for, um, for specific use. So for example, we have um, a standardized exhibit image that we just push to the machine and then uh, compartmentalize our exhibit applications and put them back on the application in a very streamlined and standardized process. Uh, we monitor for uptime and errors using standards-based SNMP and Windows monitoring tools so we can check for the health of the PC uptime and hardware failures. We try to be proactive in how we maintain our equipment and, and we it basically our exhibits are as a service and we try to monitor it as such. Um, using IT infrastructure, we're able to remote control exhibits to restart an application, make a configuration change or diagnose an issue. Um, standardizing on hardware allows us to commoditize the guts of our exhibit, keeping spares to swap out any time. Um, there's a failure using identical hardware, uh, streamlining the diagnosis process and reducing downtime that is visible to the customer. And that's key. Next slide. Um, we uh, also use a, um, a system called Nodal, um, which, uh, I'll go back a step. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, started off with many, we started off with many galleries, each on their own um, complicated open closed procedures. Um, staff required training and events were very problematic. Um, we were um, able to use a system called Nodal to rapidly deploy technology in, into existing uh, galleries to connect and to control them. Uh, we now have over 100 exhibits networked and controlled by one platform. Um, uh, no electronic or digital exhibit is manually operated anymore. Uh, this open source uh, system was made by museums for museums um, by an organization in Australia. Um, <laughs> we were um, able to deploy um, automation very rapidly um, to our first gallery and we were able to span our deployment across the organization within um, a year. Um, this last slide is, uh, since I'm over time, just, uh, just a quick GUI to show what um, the operating system looks like for our control within our galleries, and it's organized by gallery and gives a status in red if there's something wrong with it. Uh, for us at Ingenium, there's a lot of parallels in terms of um, um, some of the things that we were trying to, 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 uh, to tackle with our software infrastructure as well. Um, the, so there's, a, there's some key common functions like uh, content management, um, the, the actual system management, there's logging and uh, analytics, um, there's, um, there's a, a software build and deployment piece, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail, um, and also some, th some bits around a, um, our, our service desk as well. Uh, next slide, please. So um, there, there's, um, uh, there's two kind of um, main software um, chunks that, that we organize that into. One was um, a lot of the, um, the actual interactive management there's a there's a there's a there's a custom um, exhibit management system that um, that we've that we've um, uh, that we've deployed uh, modeled on and, and sort of building off of a code stack that from that, uh, that other institutions have worked with and we've coupled that with uh, with things from the the um, the Atlassian suite so things like Jira for our service desk and uh, you know using bitbucket and so forth um, and uh, next slide please one 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 uh, useful um, thing for us is that um, that the EMS gives us kind of a window into the into the floor of the museum where we can see live what's going on on the um, on the museum uh, on the museum floor. Um, but uh, the, the significant kind of thing for us that um, that might be a bit of a differentiator for our needs was um, we knew that for our, our digital interactives we would have a lot of um, there'd be a lot of custom coding uh, involved. Uh, to create uh, to create um, certain kinds of uh, digital experiences, some of them headless experiences with even that don't even have a computer screen, but they're but they're but they're computer controlled. So um, so we um, we connected um, our our Bitbucket repository to our to our EMS deployment system, um, and so we we um, we can be getting sort of uh, um, um, like uh, like dozens of updates. Uh, the, the email on the right here sort of illustrates an example of um, of. Of updates just coming constantly from our design build firms, and we're able to redeploy those in minutes onto the right, right onto the museum floor. So this this process of continuous integration, making sure our code is uh, our code is active and coherent um, and and deployable right to the floor, has been a has been a key thing that we've done. Um, can we can we save the question to the end? Thanks. Um, so. When it came to uh, integrating our system, our enterprise content management system, um, really focusing back on, on that first slide with uh, the real uh, sort of heavy digital content within a large space, and knowing that that content would have to update and change 
um, because the contempor contemporaneity of our subject matter. Um, I, ch I had to think of like how many staff would I possibly need in order to produce and reproduce content. Also thinking with the evolution of visitor expectations and personal technology, um, how would we get into a scenario where we wouldn't have to spend valuable resources reproducing the content that we had already produced but for a new digital endpoint. Um, so this uh, image on the left is a whiteboard that I drew in, in early 2010 of the concept of uh, the enterprise content management system. And then on the right-hand side is the logical diagram of the system as ex exists today. Scott is, uh, Gillum is sitting right there. He's the guy with the scarf. Um, <laughs> Scott, if you just want to raise your hand. So Scott's team was really instrumental in actually architecting and developing, um, bringing this concept into fruition. And this is a collections management system across our library, archive, and museum collections. It's our enterprise search and it's our content management system. And the strict separation of content and presentation um, that is all of our material within this system feeds all of our digital endpoints. So it's a web content management system methodology applied to the entirety of the museum. Um, the next slide is sort of the ecosystem that we're looking at in, ter in terms of digital. And so you can see the ecosystem is quite diverse, but it's all fed from the ECMS. Um, and this allows us to be scalable. What we've learned in the three years since opening is that this ecosystem we have is only getting more and more complicated. It's a jungle now. It's, it's not getting simpler, even though standardization is increasing and uh, we're, better able, we're better aware of how to manage everything. Um, what we're trying to do with this data is only becoming more complicated and more sophisticated. And that's where the um, open source nature of what we built, if you go to the next slide, um, this is uh, sort of the, the open source software we're using in order to create the CCMS um, has been integral to allow us to grow. Um, we don't know what we want to do next uh, until we get there, but we want the system that we've built uh, to be flexible and broad enough to allow us to do what we want to do, even though we don't know what we want to do yet. Um, if I have one more sort of story about it, one thing we started doing this year as we evolved the ECMS is we store all of our text in the ECMS and treat it as a digital asset. And that's text that may be printed or screened on a wall, an artifact label, a caption for an image. It's all born digital. No one's writing that or composing it on a typewriter. Um, and we all, uh, we catalog it and treat it as a digital asset, even though it isn't. Uh, that helps us with version control. And that now means that any of this text we can send to any digital endpoint we want to as well because it's existing in that system. So now, <clears throat> Out of systems and into people. Um, so what I found um, since I've been at the Cleveland Museum of Art is that we had to keep restructuring our team. And what we had was that we were constantly um, uh, in project management of multiple um, uh, interfaces, be it for visitors or for the staff. And we, um, at the same time, had to manage these systems. So I ended up breaking the team into sort of two sides where we have, uh, I so call it sort of the technology team, which is um, supporting it and all the infrastructure. But as a project is um, deployed, it's then all the testing and everything that needs to be done is done on the technology side where the applica application and the project managers or we call it sort of the digital side, but that a project, everybody knows where it is, everybody uses um, the same platforms to write tickets, um, and then also everybody is in the spaces that these are being used, be it, um, as I said, an application to um, manage uh, the collection or an interactive. Um, and this has um, sort of gone well for the team. The other thing is, um, is that, uh, as I mentioned before, we have um, our help desk, um, we call them techs now because they're throughout the whole museum, and they know every single interactive that is, on, that is going on in an exhibition or in the permanent galleries or in Art Lens Gallery. This way, um, they know how to reboot or fix it from anywhere, but they also are now in the space to help explain to people, um, and in this case it was the developers, how the wall works. Um, <laughs> Uh, we also, and we continue to use Log Me In. Again, we always have a tech actually um, in the galleries, but at the same time, anybody will see that there, there's two, we use Meraki throughout um, the entire building, so we know if certain galleries are really, are really um, filled, we can um, view through video cameras 
um, which spaces are, um, if the tech is really busy, and then other people can reboot or restart something so there's never a black screen. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do um, was to give, um, to, was to empower our staff and to give them tools to be able to do their job um, easier, or easier and better and more effectively. Um, so we wanted to bring our IT tools to the exhibit management and to allow staff to take action um, with regards to an exhibit that isn't behaving correctly. By carrying a, an iPad and using um, our nodal dashboard, they're able to turn an exhibit on or off, uh, change a gallery schedule, or VNC into an application to close dialog. Um, they're also empowered to connect with IT and exhibit staff um, to create a ticket and to own that process through uh, beginning to end. Um, it, this has allowed, um, it's, it's really transformed how we have our visitor experience staff operate. Um, before they were like, they were just not allowed to do anything. Um, they wanted to, a lot of people had computer science degrees but happened to be in, in visitor experience and they were just like, oh sorry, it's IT's area, can't touch it. But now we've given them the tools and we've given them the permission to exercise their ability. And this has really transformed the, the experience for the customers. Uh, they're just experiencing way fewer uh, downed exhibits um, and it, it increases morale, like the staff are connected to the process. So for us, um, one, um, one key thing that we did in terms of um, making sure that our big systems project really um, connected with people and met the needs of people was um, we, took, um, we took a page from the Agile playbook and, and, and made extensive use of, uh, of user stories. We didn't dive right in in terms of like building the system right away. We took the time to, to sit down with, with virtually every function within the organization. So everyone from the, our, our visitor experience team on the floor, um, our, our e and reps and our visitor, um, our visitor advocates, um, marketing, business development, facilities, the IT and the techs, just on and on and on. And we, we captured a, an extensive number of, uh, of, uh, of user stories. Uh, we did, we did um, uh, go through these and prioritize these, but, um, uh, but this was a, for us, this was a really, really a, um, um, a key step to making sure that, um, that we'd be able to uh, um, address some uh, needs of, 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 and um, uh, processes that really cut across traditional silos in the organization. Um, next slide, please. And so, uh, and so the system was very much built with, uh, with keeping these user stories uh, uh, top of mind. And so, um, similar to Jordan's example, um, one, uh, some of the scenarios that we're seeing are the way um, a visitor experience person on the, on the floor can, can make use of, uh, of elements of the system from a, from a tablet uh, and um, and uh, uh, whether whether they're empowered in terms of the control they need, uh, the ability to reboot and troubleshoot, or to initiate start start the process in terms of sort of the um, uh, tickets and so forth. That um, if there is a deficiency that's found, so um, so uh, again um, the that um, that the that the system, using user stories, the system is able to support uh, support uh, um, our whole range of users. So I have uh, this slide up because when I'm thinking about uh, the ECMS and the system and how it ties into show control, et cetera, we're able to give a lot of uh, sort of control to the, the floor staff. But what I like about uh, this photo is this is uh, within an exhibition that we developed where three of our, our team uh, went to Guatemala and, uh, and recorded first person testimony in 360 degree video and we produced a virtual reality experience for in gallery um, so that we had the artifacts from Guatemala in the gallery and then we transported the visitors to Guatemala to hear the testimony about those artifacts. Um, but what this really meant to me in terms of ECMS systems and staff was that employee engagement. Um, you know, what would um, my team prefer to be working on? Um, developing a new uh, 360 degree VR story or reproducing the work that we did previously so that we could get it to fit a new format. And if we go to the next slide, um, what the ECMS does to us in terms of uh, employee engagement and staff engagement is um, everyone in the museum has access to Exhibit Manager or can have access to Exhibit Manager, which will allow them to browse all of the content within that system. So all of the collections, all of the digital assets, et cetera. Um, so anyone can explore what we're doing for their own purposes, uh, any, of the, any of the content for their own purposes. It could be the comms person, marketing, social media, it could be a curator, it could be a collection staff, et cetera. Um, 
So it starts to break down walls between uh, the different departments. Um, and it starts to even build understanding and empathy and capacity um, for people in specific roles versus others. What does intellectual property and copyrights management mean? And that information being tracked in a content management system would allow someone to understand when they can use an asset, when they can't, and not have to constantly be tapping our copyright coordinator on the shoulder to ask. Um, individually, it means people can spend their time being creative instead of being in production. Um, so in terms of uh, employee engagement and happiness, um, back to that image of uh, the people with the VR headsets, you know, my team would much rather be spending their time being creative than being in production. And then in terms of the museum overall, uh, we see an impact based on um, different perspectives. Um, having things be accessible to people means that we get different perspectives on those things. And this leads to innovation as well as us being able to do more with less. So while it's not, um, you know, I, I didn't, didn't want to just sort of go with the um, you know, people on the store are empowered to control the film in the theater, et cetera. Um, this is a unique way that I think that the ECMS is causing a change to our corporate culture and um, affecting employee engagement. Sustainability. I'm not going to really say much here except throw this photo up, which I've used before, but it, because I love it. <laughs> not just because I really like the Incredible Hulk when I was a kid, but um, like this is this is it, right? Like imagine the potential. This is simply incredible. This you know Tandy or whatever it is um, computer, and then it's like a really uh, big set of golden handcuffs. Um, so technology we know has the power um, to facilitate. Um, amazing experiences, uh, operational efficiencies, et cetera. But if not um, you know, uh, employed um, correctly, then it becomes, uh, it becomes a prison and it can shrink later on. Um, so as I said, uh, that Artland's exhibition, um, that was the sort of the core of Gallery One. And the reason we we, we had looked at evaluations and um, users, and um, although it was very successful, we realized that this space would be the hardest to be scalable because we had to constantly move artwork, we had to come up with thematic groupings, and we still wanted to have games that were engaging using um, innovation in new ways. So um, we this space is now created in that like you'll that it will rotate every 18 months like any exhibition. Um, the objects are based, like currently they're based on, um, you'll look at an object and then you'll see it in the background and you'll walk up to it and you can start, there's no more um, touch screens, but you can start understanding this object through composition, maybe geometric, maybe um, a multi-focus or um, abstract, uh, the purpose of an object that it originally, it had an original intent at one point and maybe you'll look at it in a whole different way or symbols or um, emotion and gesture and how that changes an object. But we would want to add more games each time we did an exhibition simply by, as we talked about, it was the back end and the management of the hardware and with the people in the space, but also now that um, by doing this, we can really, if we realize, you know what, we want to have a way of looking at objects through narrative or through conservation, we can really work with a firm that can easily focus, just like um, as Corey said, on really the fun part of making this new experience. Um, and also, I mean, everything about this project has been about removing the barriers. Our, when someone says, oh my God, you guys have the most amazing collection, that's the success of this project, not like, oh, the, that touch screen is really cool. Um, again, also, I just am showing this. We had a brainstorming system. We invited colleagues, um, um, see uh, digital people from top museums, and we had our director spend an entire day, which is a real gift to say, in the brainstorming session, um, really thinking about what worked and didn't work. And um, we brought, we also had community artists and also other people in the museum that, um, that weren't so closely tied to Gallery One to begin with. And through that, we really like looked out of the box and what could this really be? And then again, we have the team of, we created this, but then it went into our product management. And now, again, we're part of, part of this activity, like the app is in, is now back in um, product um, project management, while me, the rest of the space is in product management, and it goes back and forth. And this way, we can keep things live and going, and not having this big project that we're starting from scratch. 
For us, um, IT is now involved early and wholly in the design and implementation process. Uh, reviewing design build contracts, testing and evaluating capability management and int uh, integrating, integrating into our systems, uh, web and social elements. Um, standards are kept and integrated into the design process, allowing us to better service the rapid growth of digital interactives. And uh, we're constantly evaluating our tools and processes, looking for improvements, sharing these with our counterparts uh, from our education department and exhibit staff. Um, but it comes with its uh, challenges too, um, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, through a continuous uh, service model, um, IT staff have to go through an, a new thought process on how to proactively support our guest staff um, and our, our floor staff uh, regarding this technology. Um, we have to focus on delivery, um, which I mean, obviously on an IT back of house kind of thing we always do, but now we're really thinking about the, um, the public customer. Um, so we have to ensure we have a quick response time. Um, this is a change in priorities between back and front of house. Uh, we have to um, support both and knowing that our visitors notice when an exhibit is down. Uh, we do work collaboratively with the exhibits department to achieve this though. Um, this uh, increased um, collaboration and widening of scope in the traditional IT does uh, need to be considered with this approach, um, but the efficiency gains are definitely worth it. Okay, so um, thinking about sustainability, so there's uh, there's a few different things that um, that um, that uh, came up from our um, from our project, uh, and so I'm just going to touch on them briefly in terms of how our new approach has helped us sort of deal with some some previous pain points that we've um, that we've experienced, and I think sets us well for the future. One of them is around uh, around uh, standards. So um, there's a whole mix of standards that we've put in place now that we didn't really have before. Everything from Interface standards. Um, thanks, Corey. The, 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 some of our interface uh, um, sort of uh, conventions might look a little familiar. To um, to um, uh, the um, uh, hardware programming languages and so forth. So these are these are um, the, uh, that's that's one of the one of the key um, key dimensions for us uh, for sustainability. A second one um, is around um, around software. Actually, making sure that we. Um, that we have ownership of the source code, that we man that maintain the source code, that that source code stays active and is it, it, and remains deployable to the floor, and the documentation that goes along with that. So, um, so that's a, that's a second um, a second key point for us. Um, a third one is um, is using some of these systems to support agile work methods. Some of these new ways of of working. We've we've in our digital shop we've very much been. Uh, in, you know, increasingly adopting uh, agile uh, agile approaches, so that's that's a it's a culture shift that's actually spreading out across the across the organization and spilling out into other functions within the organization. Uh, a fourth aspect is uh, is is it, it ties to that um, that um, that theme I brought up earlier, but but uh, how how the system can help us um, manage manage uh, manage processes across silos. So breaking down those those silos and allowing people to work more effectively together, even when they're coming from different uh, different functions. And then the fifth, the fifth one, and this is a bit more aspirational, but uh, but what we're, what we're aiming to do with analytics, we've built in a lot of um, a lot of logging and analytics into our um, into our uh, um, exhibit management system. We're only opening next week, so um, it, it's not it actually isn't um, it's not proven in the field, but we're hoping that we'll be able to get the information we need or better be, better actual information to be able to make better decisions moving forward. So um, this is a 24-person a touch table um, that looks at <laughs> genocide. Um, so <laughs> thanks, Bruce. Hey, hey genocide. Um, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada delivered their final report uh, about two years ago, um, our story in the residential school system in Canada was outdated uh, as soon as the report was made public. And this is the kind of thing that happens with that contemporary subject matter that we have. So uh, the workflow for changing the content in this study table and wherever else that content might appear is really quite simple. Um, the user interface, the, the business interface for the ECMS can be accessed and the content can be changed and we can publish it live to the gallery. Um, so in this case, the longest part of that workflow was, um, was translating our text into French and licensing an image. Um, if we're using any of the assets that we already have, then the, lo the longest part of the workflow is just newly composing something or editing something and pushing publish. 
Um, so when we think of sustainability, um, you know, this is something that would affect 24 users um, at this installation, at this instance, and more if that content is shared to another digital instance. So this idea of sustainability for us is how do we make those changes as quickly as possible and perpetuate those changes across all of the instances of its use. In the next, uh, in this slide, um, thinking of assets as well, um, in terms of every video, we have captions, we have American Sign Language, Langue des Signes Québécoises, and captions in French. So we have a bunch of what we call child assets for every primary asset. And they're all individual assets, so in this case, we can send them to different locations. So where we would have the captions and the sign interpreter on a screen, we can also send them to the mobile device. Um, we can start to use things for ways that we didn't really think we would use them in the past. Um, or when we originally conceived of the, the need to design and develop. So when we get to the next slide, um, in terms of um, scalability, we spend our time producing instead of reproducing. We leverage the work that's already done when something new comes up. Um, we're responsive, so like with the Truth and Reconciliations report or some event that happens, we can change our content really quickly. Uh, in the exhibitions, it takes way fewer people. We don't have to get a graphic designer to, produ to design the new content, a producer to uh, produce the content, a web developer to upload. It's all happening through the content management system. The curator, the writer can be responsible for that themselves. Um, and this is a cost-effective change in perpetuity. So when we're thinking how we're managing our budgets going into the future, we're managing our budgets again doing um, the fun stuff, the new stuff, and we're spending our employee human resources on the fun stuff and the new stuff. And then um, we're inclusive. Um, so um, an offset of having all of our text in the content management system means that using text-to-speech on the mobile device, we can have all of that text read aloud to someone who can't see it. Um, so we're able to think of our audience in terms of being uh, sustainable as well, in that we can serve everyone for longer. And um, yeah, that's kind of a different aspect to our approach to sustainability. And so um, these are just four perspectives in terms of the, some of the challenges that we're all uh, facing with respect to how we're managing this digital, the, the, this digital experience. Uh, we've been looking at through these three lenses, through systems, people, sustainability. So we just want to turn it over to, to everyone here. Uh, what are some of the biggest obstacles that, that you're facing in terms of managing your digital experience? What are some of the angles or the solutions that you've been, uh, that you've been working with? So maybe we can sort of turn it over to questions. Um, there was one over here. Maybe we'll start. Okay, yeah, so I'll just repeat the question. So, um, so what kind of systems are we putting in place in term, uh, with regard to analytics and measuring, uh, measuring usage? So, um, yeah, so for, for, for us, um, um, uh, uh, building in, building in um, sort of logging and reporting was a, was a, was a key piece of what we were, what we were tackling. We, um, we have things like um, sort of standardized components like video players, for example, and so we just automatically, we, 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 we um, we, we build in the the, um, the analytics around recording, uh, how you know how often video is uh, is played, um, is it is it is it uh, is it played through what language and so forth on and on, uh, and 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 then those standard components are are distributed to the different firms working with us so that, that they get as much of the analytics for free, and if they do custom stuff, they can they can code with the analytics framework as well. That's how we've approached it. Um, uh, others. Yeah, so um, we, much the same way. That's kind of like the hot question for us of the last year or so. Um, but we've really folded it into evaluation as well. Um, so um, because what was happening was we were starting to pull analytics from either social or any of the digital installations in gallery or ticketing or whatever. And then we we're having, there's, you know, I'm one of four vice presidents at the executive. And uh, you know we're all t using the same uh, analytic source and giving different interpre interpretation of what it means. Um, so we've been trying to sort of standardize our uh, analytics approach. Uh, Bruce is sitting in the front row has done some work with us uh, on that, and um, and we're working with Digzibit right now as well. And Angie is at the conference uh, somewhere. Um, but so we're kind of chipping away at that. We have all of the logs and all the data 
Um, but it's like, how do we actually make that usable and then push that through an interpretation that's going to be consistent and we're all going to sort of tell the same story based on the same analytics? Um, yeah, I think from the first day that 2012 when Gallery One opened, everyone was like, what are the analytics? What are your analytics? What are people using it? And it was like, uh, most analytics is all the testers and us right now, so it's not good information. But we, um, the other thing was, even though we capture analytics on every single interactive, how long did they use it? What did they use the most? Did they repeat? Blah, blah, blah. But the thing was, what do we want to learn was really what I kept pushing back because um, and then also creating reports that anybody could look at and sort of get the information. So we're doing a couple of things is that we've worked, we're working with a group that has set up some sort of customized reports for that we can easily, anybody in the museum can get the information that they're looking for. And that's de developments looking for different information than um, the visitor uh, experience team is looking for. We also, um, our, um, because our goal of, of that space is making sure people get into the galleries. Ultimately, we want you comfortable. We are giving you the tool sets to be able to look at art without just reading the didactic, without just reading the label. So we want to know, are you actually going, are you inspired through all these different ways? Because there's, our goal is to give different methods to get you into the galleries. Are you going in the galleries? And are you looking at art longer? Um, I mean, and that's, um, so we also are using, um, uh, Meraki now that and we have be I be we have beacons all throughout every single every place there's art there's eye beacons and so we are able to now know um, who through your device even if it's not on our Wi-Fi you know uh, that it's a repeat visitor how long are they staying what is the number what gallery has um, the most people Heartlands Gallery, um, and uh, you know, are they where are they going? And if they don't go that day, did they come back? We're, we're starting to be able to look to say when they came back the second time, did they spend less time, but actually went into the galleries? Um, and so we're just beginning to again look at all that to see really are these spaces, are all these interactives getting the goal that that we've set out to do, not just have a fun space at the museum. I'll just add one little thing to that. Um, we're earlier on in the um, analytics game, the reporting game, we're just starting to build a research and evaluations team. Um, but we do know that we need to collect the data and we need to have a standardized way of doing that. So we, um, any of our bespoke applications, we're using uh, Google Analytics as the logging and analytical platform, which has got its built-in reports for sessions and, um, and repeats and everything. So um, yeah, that's, that's part of our go-to from now on is to, to build events around that. We have time for like one big question. Oh yeah, quick question. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. 15, 15 minutes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, can you, I, can you, I, I couldn't quite hear. So I guess the question is, um, what happens when you have exhibitions or presentations that don't fall into Yeah, so um, I, I, I was, I'll was i repeat the question, so, and correct me if I don't quite get it wrong, but there, uh, the, um, how, how do you deal with, say, um, uh, dig, maybe it could be digital artists that, um, that, that, that are, that are maybe using sort of, um, um, they're using platforms that might not sort of fit your, your infrastructure, they want to use old school technology, or there, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's things around the way their work was originally represented, uh, um, and and then how how can how can if you're taking a systems approach to your floor, how how do you deal with these exceptions and these uh, these these uh, unusual situations? Did I paraphrase that okay? Oh, 
Okay, and so even, even rights issues about whether uh, restrictions around even putting the artwork on, on the organization servers as well as being an example. Uh, we're a science and technology museum, so we haven't tackled the, 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 I, don't, the I don't think that's as, as in, that's not as uh, prominent uh, um, a situation for us. I know for, for some of the odd exceptions that we, we have to have an exception process. There, there might be um, an, an innovative interactive that comes from a university, for example, that doesn't fit our technology platform. So we, ha we have to have ways of managing the, uh, the, the exceptions and there's some tech tools to that. But does anyone else want to take a cut at the question? At the question? I'm, well, I mean, regarding time-based media, that, I mean, we're, we consider those artworks more than digital assets. So um, our, we put our energy in how do we catalog time-based media. We also have worked a lot with um, when accessioning those type of uh, artworks, um, be helping the collection team and the acquisition team, like the other questions and the other rights we want to get with the artist and letting them understand what that means in the long run by accessioning something that won't hit certain formats. So we take time-based media totally separate um, and, um, and decide, and, and the big question is how do you show something in your collection that's time-based, like, like something like that. And so it's an interesting question. We have lots of ideas and that, that sounds like a good topic to even have, you know, for <laughs> next MCN. Um, sure. Um, I'll just dive in quickly. I and mean, we have a, a couple of um, exhibits that fall under that category. They're artists, unique creations. Um, they, obviously, they are an exception to the rule, um, but so far we've been able to wrangle them into our system one way or another. Um, so we obviously don't go and strip it down to its nuts and bolts and rebuild it using our standards. Uh, but we, we have an exception process, just like uh, Brian said, but we, we have a whole retrofit kind of gear and process to be able to bolt on to their exhibit to be able to manage it with our tools and processes. And for every single one of those exceptions, we've been able to do it. Um, it just uh, requires a little bit of creative thinking. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I would say also from us, um, we haven't run into something that's so restrictive uh, of not being able to put something on our server um, with a, a sort of trust um, sort of issue. Um, so that's not happened to us. But we always are working when we bring in temporary exhibitions or work with, uh, with living artists. Um, we have to first normally, it's kind of anything can be a human rights issue and nothing is a human rights issue. We don't like flip through the catalog of installations or traveling exhibitions and go, oh, this one's great for us. Um, it's off the shelf. So we have to do a lot of contextualization and then we all also, in terms of subject, we also have to do a lot of uh, design adjustment to meet our official languages standard, English and French, as well as our inclusive design standards. Uh, for accessibility, um, so we're always kind of adjusting and changing to begin with, and that's just going to be a prerequisite for anyone we're going to work with. Um, question over here. Um, you've talked mostly about sort of the system supporting uh, museum content outward facing, and I'm wondering if uh, maybe you could also speak to uh, participatory or user contributed content, and what sort of systems and sustainability you have in place for that? And do you consider those part of your collection? Um. Okay, so the question, just to paraphrase, so um, we, we've been talking a lot about sort of um, um, museum-generated content, but what about user-contributed user -contributed content? Um, any considerations around, around um, management, uh, sustainability, are, are these considered part of the collection? Um, we, from our perspective, we have some user-generated content, some significant user-generated content um, projects on the go, uh, like such as an innovation, crowdsourced innovation storybook um, uh, the project that we did this past year. Very, very open-ended project. We haven't, we haven't. I'll, I'll confess, we haven't gone to that stage of, um, of, um, uh, you know, what, how, how are we going to manage those stories long term? We, 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 we're, we're planning on keeping that project going and running, but. We're not we're not accessioning we're not accessioning that content in any sort of formal way right now. Any other um, thoughts? Well, oh, go ahead. Well, I mean, Scott, maybe I don't know if you fed this question to me or what, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, we just opened an exhibition called Rights uh, called um, Points of View, which was a crowdsourced um, exhibition, and the the strategy behind this exhibition was two 
it was kind of twofold. One, it was uh, the 150th anniversary of Canada this year, and we wanted to present an exhibition where the content came from Canadians. So we had a call, we had a thousand entries, we had a jury. The jury uh, process led to 72 uh, pieces for the exhibition. They still have to pass through our acquisitions committee. Um, we are acquiring them because the second strategy was to build our collection. We're a new museum. Uh, we didn't. We were born out of an act of parliament. We didn't have an existing collection to sort of work from, and so um, we do spend a lot of our time licensing and loaning and um, et cetera. And we need to build our own collection at the same time. Um, we have installations in gallery where we ask users to contribute their story, like share your story booth. Scott's team worked on, which is both in gallery and online. Um, any of that material, we're collecting it, uh, sort of small c collecting it. If we want to acquire it into our collection, it still has to pass through acquisition the same way anything else would. Um, but that's always our intention, is to throw the, the net wide and then to acquire um, from within that net. And there's, there's a number of other sort of installations that we've done that um, have user contributed content. Um. I just gonna say when I uh, I think the first day I started, people we were um, working on our online collection website, and um, we spent a lot of energy having a comment section like that, you know, so people could comment on the artworks. And every time someone looks at our app, they're like, "What about people commenting?" And people are, don't want to. They, I mean, social media is there to sort of feel more comfortable of putting your opinion or your, but commenting on a collection page, I learned quickly that that was a lot of wasted engineering um, and development for, um, Amy, bless you, for something that um, wasn't really being used. But what we did realize, um, what we have now, in, in fact, in the new Artlands Gallery space is we have this huge uh, sort of digital sign um, that, you know, says the name of the space, but there's multiple spaces in there, and when it brings it up, it has the user, visitor-generated content. So in the studio play, as you're making a portrait based on a, um, the palette and this brushstroke of an oil painting in our collection, or a charcoal or a watercolor, <coughs> yours goes up there, what you created. In the exhibition space, if you are, you try on a, um, you're wearing an African, um, headdress, you know, your your photo goes up there. If you're creating a new abstract painting based on something in our collection, it goes up there. Um, you create a tour, and so we found out, we used to have create a tour, and I think 99% of the tours were test, you know, um, and now you actually have like um, awkward stage, and someone has a tour of the awkward stage in art gallery, or um, my favorite was um, Kofefi and it was Russian artworks. And um, yeah. so, I mean, people really get into it, but what's really fun is that it's all this is created by the visitors. People see it, and then it gives them sort of like the ability to use our collection to um, get creative and um, look closer. And we have multiple other things, like things go to a Tumblr page. We're very much about of saying, like, let your stuff get out there. Um, but I guess the, la the question of do we accession that? No, but we do like, give it to everyone to inspire them. Yeah, maybe I'd also add that um, we had an exhibition called Sight Unseen, it was a photography exhibition um, where the photographs were taken by blind photographers. Um, we also, we challenged um, people within the space to uh, take photos um, using voiceover, so we called it the voiceover photo challenge. Um, using iPods um, within the gallery, they'd take photos. Those photos would go to an Instagram feed. Uh, they were curated and projected on the wall beside the um, actual images um, by the artist. Um, so people saw their images um, in context of uh, the rest of the artists. Um, but uh, those all went into what we call a working collection. And so all of that material, again, if we wanted them to be part of the actual museum collection, or the national collection were a national museum, they would have to be uh, acquired and accessioned in that way. But we have this massive amount of content that's our, we, which we call the working collection that has a lot of this material in so that we could use it for marketing promotion if we have the rights, et cetera, to do all kinds of things with. But uh, we work with it, but it's not actually the museum's collection. Um, we, we do user-generated content in a very simplistic way. Um, Twitter feed walls on the on the display. It's, it's a marketing and promotion piece. It's a deepening engagement piece. Um, we allow our users to pretty much upload anything. It quickly gets moderated and, and put on display, but it's fairly disposable. Uh, it doesn't have any long-term um, use. 
um, unless something really pops the curator's eye and then they'll go and ask to use it for something else. But that's really the exception, not the rule. So. And there was a question. Okay. Over here. Yes, I was wondering if um, anybody on the panel is uh, working with education departments to use these systems as outreach to uh, classrooms. Whether there's any kind of like, you know, beyond like making the exhibition experience uh, accessible outside the museum, any way of creating like, for lack of a better word, curriculum or anything like that that uses <coughs> internal systems. So I'll, I'll try to paraphrase. So is anyone using these systems to create uh, um, experiences for education purposes, uh, uh, to create experiences for classrooms? Um, anyone want to take a first cut at that? We're doing that right now um, w as part of a new web project. Um, so again, all those assets exist, and they've, all, they've already been curated, so any, any of the pieces of our collection. Um, and what we're building uh, in terms of the intention of our web project is to allow um, people to assemble those assets into compositions. Um, and so um, if you can imagine a learning resource um, that follows a certain um, metadata standard profile and that links to curriculum, um, and, and a museum educator can then go through the collection that's uh, accessible through the exhibition manager or that interface to our dam, um, pick the assets that they want and create these compositions that are tied to curriculum and then are based on a metadata standard. So this is very similar to a project I did in 2007. Uh, it's called a virtual learning environment. It's been used by about 800 museums in Canada now and we're trying to do the, the same kind of thing um, using our own collection um, and the uh, systems that we've uh, that we created the ECMS. As, and then the, basically the interface that the user would use would be developed as part of this web project that we're engaged in right now. And um, I was gonna say, that's interesting that you brought that up because um, I just met with, there's, uh, with the education team and now that, especially our lens exhibition, which is really, our goal is sort of, it's an art survey class through gameplay, you know, that you really understand these topics of that you would normally learn in, an art 101 class, I said, so here it's built in, um, now, like, you know, go wild, what is the programs that you can, you can create using this space, you know, and then come back to us with what's missing or what do you need or what's a, a way to put a whole, like, teacher resource into place that people could do this before they come to the museum or how they can use these, these experiences in the classroom. So um, I think a lot of times museums get confused with, like, oh, well, everyone should be creating them. It's actually, these are the tool sets. Now you need to like use them, go wild, and like, create programs for others to um, use these tools in new ways. I'll just briefly add, um, we occasionally uh, build in, in part of an interactive, a takeaway component, um, something that a user can experience after they've been to the museum. Um, a couple of these could lend themselves to, uh, and probably do lend themselves to, to teacher talking points to discuss your experience in the museum as, as prolonging it and deepening engagement. So we have a, a handful of these experiences. One of them is um, a voting experience where um, you can vote in the museum uh, about your favorite artifact or your favorite exhibit, um, and you can continue to take that away and, and reflect on it and see the, the results as they change over time. Um, that would just be an example. Um, uh, for us, we're we're um, uh, we're in the process of rebuilding <coughs> our um, our educational programs uh, for the Science and Technology Museum, um, and and exploring how we can leverage the floor uh, with uh, for th for some of those programs. But that's very much sort of a work in progress. We have other things that are not connected to our floor project, like our three D digitization program, um, and um, and building consciously building educational. Uh, materials and working with educational partners around interpreting 3D um, technologies. Um, so that's, but that's 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 like a whole separate stream for uh, for us. Other questions? We're, 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 we're just about time. Uh, okay. Well, uh, all right. Well, we're at we're at time, folks. So uh, thank you. So if you if you've got any questions for us afterwards, let us know. Thanks.
we'll, we'll put the slides on SlideShare. We did talk a lot about what was the best way to do this with an hour with such diverse projects. We know this is sort of a little bit of everything, but it might inspire more questions and ideas for your own institutions. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks.